Snowbreak Containment Zone is a third-person shooter gacha game with some pretty fun mechanics, kind of like a combination of Destiny 2 and PGR. And I've played the CBT till the end game, experiencing pretty much everything that is possible during the first two weeks. And here's what I think about the game so far. Let's start with the combat first. Each character has four types of skills. Standard skills are your basic skills of every character, which can be used by consuming S energy, which you gain when you attack enemies with your weapons. And they also have support skills, which is not like QTE in PGR, but more like using the skills of off-field characters. And these skills are different from the standard skills that they have when they're on field, which can be pretty game-changing for some stages. For example, Akashia has a support skill that slows time for an enemy and it works on bosses, which is really, really good. Ultimate skills are used by consuming U energy, which is also something you gain by damaging enemies. And you can use the ultimate skills of off-field characters when they are charged up. So that's a pretty interesting mechanic as well. The fourth type of skill that all characters have is passive skills, which is generally pretty normal for most gachas. But passive skills in this game are actually pretty well designed and they add a flavor to the character's kit, which is pretty interesting. There is also a ricochet mechanic where armored enemies can ricochet your bullets based on the weapon that you're using to shoot them, which makes it so that all of the weapons kind of have their own specialty and all of them are viable in some way. So you have sort of more flexibility on what kind of themes you want to build. But surely there will be some kind of meta. However, when there are stages, like specific stages in some game modes, it might be useful to bring up some A ranks or some less meta characters that are better for those stages to get a higher score. Your combat kit is also quite heavily influenced by how many dupes you have of a character. They get huge modifications on their active and passive skills. And mainly, it's the fact that these skills can add additional effects to the active skills or change what happens after you do an ultimate skill. It's actually pretty interesting to see what kind of rotations you have, but your optimal rotations are heavily based on the dupes you have. Moreover, certain weapons have passive skills that can give a huge increase in DPS, especially 5-star weapons, which also do kind of the same thing by upgrading the skills with special effects, which really change the kit of the character. The core gameplay mechanics are solid, and boss fights like Sartre and Cerberus are really well designed. They've combined bullet hell with some creative boss mechanics such that you have to use weapons that are the right fit for what you need at certain phases for the boss fights. The combat feels satisfying sometimes, but the sound design is not always on point. I've mainly had issues with some of the weapons just not having an impact. There's also like just not enough of a feedback from the enemies in animation sometimes. So they need to really work on that. I'm not sure how they're gonna do that by the time of release, but that really needs to be fixed. Though I will say that it is very fun to try out different combinations of standard support and ultimate skills to adapt to different scenarios that you encounter in the excellent stage design that Season Games has done. Usually there is a variety of verticality and covers and stuff that you can do with bombs and shooting enemies with different kinds of effects. It's quite fun to think of the many different ways you can encounter a certain stage. They give you a lot of options to play with, which is really nice. Now, let's move on to the story. The story is very easy at the start, but it does get harder later on, around chapter 7 and 8, 
you can especially face a huge difficulty increase in the last boss fight in chapter 8 but I think it's a good difficulty curve for most casual players because there need to be ease in to the game since pretty skill reliant game for the most part and a lot of the story has live 2D art but I don't really like the live 2D visual novel style reading so I'm not a huge fan of it but the cutscenes are pretty nice they are alright very decent not very impressive though because the graphics are just not that good moving on to voice acting I think the English voice acting for the characters is actually pretty good only some characters have some issues uh, with like the style not really matching the personality of the characters and some of them just have annoying voice acting but the Japanese voice acting is incredibly good so I would actually recommend playing with the Japanese voice acting if you're a fan of Japanese voice acting in anime or other games that you play. When it comes to the graphics, I think the graphics for the character models are in a weird uncanny valley. I really just can't get into it. I'm quite surprised that they're going forward with these play doll models for release even after all the feedback from previous beta tests it doesn't make sense to me why they are doing this because I have a hard time imagining who would want to pull for more characters after looking at these models but the music however is top tier the soundtrack has so many bangers which is a huge reason actually for why I want to keep playing the game and when it comes to the performance of the game on PC I would say that the game ran pretty smooth I had no crashes and very stable frames per second and even co-op was not as laggy as I expected it to be which was pretty surprising the menus and the UI is also very snappy so they can get a little confusing and hard to navigate at times. Now let's talk about the gacha system. For the character gacha, you have a 0.7% drop rate for S ranks and the hard pity is at 80 pulls. The rates are really low and pulling dupes feels terrible because ideally you want to get as many characters as possible since you can farm shards of all characters with stamina. Now, these are the rates for the standard banner in the CBT. We don't really have a clue for what the rates will be like for the limited banners. So, this seems pretty rough for a gacha system. The summon animation is kind of whatever. I don't really feel any excitement in getting 5 star units. So, I think they should revamp this in the future. Not really necessary at launch, but definitely revamp is necessary in the future. For the weapon gacha, you can select the 5 star weapon you want to summon but it's a 50% chance to be the one you selected and the 5 star weapons have the same 0.7% drop rate like the character gacha but the pity for the 5 star weapons is at 60 pulls. Now coming to the characters aspect of the game, I think the character writing is pretty decent and it's not all female characters, there is one male character in the game but he was not available outside of the story mode in the CBT so I think there will likely be more male characters added in the future. In terms of combat kits, most of the characters are viable to play since all characters have their own strengths, specialties and weaknesses. In fact, A rank characters with dupes can be way way stronger than base S rank characters so they will be very useful in early game. For example, Akashia and Frisia are way better than all the S rank characters at clearing mobs, especially if they have dupes. And when it comes to team building, you usually want a sniper for high damage, a character that's good at clearing mobs, and a flex character that is good for short range DPS, support buffs, healing, or special skills like Moxer's Soul Extraction. My recommendations for a ranks to raise at launch are Akashia, Frisia, Life, 
Marianne and Fanny since investing in them is going to be very good for creating good themes and also clearing challenges in the story mode. Now I want to touch a little bit on the progression system. You have the basic progression of leveling up characters and weapons, but there are also three other systems that greatly influence their combat kit. The first system is logistics. Generally you want to farm the 5 star logistics set to get the set effect but a terrible part of this gearing system is that it's like artifacts in Genshin where you have random substats though so min-maxing these might take forever. There wasn't enough time in the CBT to max out the logistics to unlock their last talent and they all have these ascended versions so there's probably more to this gearing system that I don't know about. The second system is manifestations which is the dupe system of snowbreak dupes in this game can completely change the kit of a character they are extremely important their effects can make a seemingly unviable character really strong in certain circumstances you don't have to worry about pulling dupes of characters since you can actually farm them using stamina and they're only gated by time so over time you'll get the dupes of the characters that you want to max out the third system is Neuronics. This is probably the most confusing system for most players since they don't really explain what alignment index and Davos alignment mean. So the way this system works is that you have three rows of two clusters. The first row is for the standard skill, the second row is for the support skill and the third row is for the ultimate skill. You can add special effects and upgrade the skills of a character by using fiber axons to unlock nodes. The small nodes increase your alignment index and the big nodes unlock special upgrades. And for each cluster you've finished upgrading, you level up your Davos alignment passive skill which scales with the alignment index. They should really just simplify the system. It doesn't have to be this complicated though it is a good attempt to add more flavor to the skill upgrading system most gachas don't let you have this level of customization and the great thing about this system is that you can easily farm the resources for unlocking the nodes and you can also reset the entire thing for free if you want to change the build to try out the other clusters all right, and now I'm going to try to explain some of the game modes. Personal files are like interludes in PGR, where you can see the personal stories of the characters and farm their shards. That's right, you can even farm shards of S rank units, which is huge because the dupes matter a lot in this game. You can farm a maximum of 6 shards of A rank characters and 4 shards of S rank characters every day but there is a daily limit for S ranks so you can only farm 2 shards for a particular S rank character. The only bad thing I would say is that it takes a lot of stamina to farm these. So this is an endgame activity but it also takes a lot of stamina to acquire and upgrade logistic. The next game mode is operations. This is where you farm all the resources needed for progression. For farming the 5 star logistics officers in the game, you have to select the squad that you want and then keep doing the hardest stage available to make progress till you can claim a random logistic officer from the squad selected. This is pretty painful if you can't get your entire squad since the stamina cost is pretty high. There is also no auto clear. But after your first clear, you can multi-clear by consuming up to 4 times the stamina. Giga Link is where you do co-op modes. And District Patrol is a really cool roguelike game mode where you match with other players and go through a mission with random buffs. They encourage players to play certain characters every week which adds some variety to the teams you'll see. So this game mode is the most fun part of the game for me. I don't even care about the trash rewards that you get for doing this. I just kept playing this mode whenever I found others to play with. The roguelike aspect just has so much replayability. I even played solo and two shot the boss with Yao. He's really OP with the right build. 
Dispatch has four more morphs, Underground Purge, Neural Simulation, Dash of Honor, and Tactic Evaluation. In Underground Purge, there are two morphs. Abandoned Area is a permanent game mode and Yotun Tunnel is a weekly one. For Abandoned Area, you have to fulfill challenges with two teams of three characters. They are more like puzzle challenge stages that you need to plan for in advance to get all the rewards. Yotun Tunnel is actually quite similar to Abandoned Area but more combat oriented. You have a random buff every week for all stages and random nerfs for each stage. You have to check the challenges before entering to make sure to complete them since they revolve around team building sometimes or using ultimates. The second mode is Neural Simulation. Neural Simulation is like Babel Tower in PGR. You have two teams of three, one for each boss and the bosses reset every week. Your goal is to get to the highest difficulty and then choose all the modifiers to get the highest score for rewards. It's pretty simple and it can be a fun endgame activity since you get to choose how challenging you want it to be. I also use this mode to test out builds and teams for boss fights. The third mode is Clash of Honor. Clash of Honor is sort of like the survival mode in Warframe where you have to defend against three waves of enemies. You unlock higher difficulties as you clear this game mode every week. I think this game mode might be fun at higher difficulties but I feel like this mode just takes too much time for a weekly activity to be honest. The last mode is Tactic Evaluation which is basically a tower mode where you have to complete the trials which is mostly just killing enemies and progressing through the phases. It's nothing special but it gives decent rewards and you only have to clear it one time. Let's talk about the shop now. In the regular supplier section, Ascension materials and shards are the most worth buying. And in the data resource section, this is where you buy character and weapon banner tickets with the gacha currency. In the event exchange section, this is where you can collect rewards for doing the weekly game mode. So for example, in Clash of Honor, you can buy the 5 star weapon parts, which provides slight stat increases to the weapons. In Underground Forge Shop, you can buy Logistic Officers, their Ascension Materials, and even an item that lets you refund all the resources you invested into a Logistics Officer. In Neural Simulation Shop, you can buy Shards for Manifestations and Maps for the Neuronic System. In the Circulation Hub section, you can exchange currency you get from the new four dupes in the Gacha system to get more tickets and maps. And in the decomposition section, you can exchange your leftover shards after maxing out a character's manifestation for shards of equivalent rarity. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about the replayability of the game. Dailies and weeklies can take some time to complete. This game is meant to be manual play, so it's not very friendly towards casual players without a lot of time. However, those who have a lot of free time will find that there is a lot of replayability to the game, especially in the roguelike co-op mode. Teaming with friends and others to fight bosses can be a really fun experience. Additionally, I think trying out different teams and builds in neural simulation will be a lot of fun for theory crafters. And in terms of the enemy variety, I think the enemy variety was actually really good. For a close beta test, I was quite impressed. There's a decent variety of mods, elites, and bosses, which keeps the survival game mode Clash of Honors a little fresh. The biggest pain point for me from the CBT is the stamina system. Everything just requires so much stamina, but it's really hard to regen stamina, and they didn't give enough packs for us to level faster to the end game for testing either. I don't think this system will be changed, which is quite disappointing but I think it's just going to be really hard to manage the investment of stamina. So my overall impressions is that I'm very excited for the game because I see the potential from raids in Destiny 2 and Outriders. Mainly what I want to see is co-op content with difficult boss mechanics, 
and environment interactions and bullet hell which they've already shown but they just have to make it available in co-op so people can play with their friends and even make friends from matchmaking or on discord or reddit or whatever i think that's really where they can kind of create a community for content creators and streamers as well so i think most of the potential of the game lies in the hardcore audience doing co-op in-game content. Maybe they could even add dungeons, which would be very interesting. My advice to you would be to try out the gameplay because it's actually really fun despite the clay doll aesthetic of the characters. The music is really good and the stage design is really good. Some of the boss fights are really good too. And I think that the future of the game is really good given how well they've designed the stages and boss fights so far. I think they could really go far with the co-op boss fights if they added this mode. Keep in mind, I think this game is mainly designed for the PC version. I don't think the mobile versions are going to play as well as I've been saying. And I've only tested everything on the PC version. So that's what I would recommend trying out first. And that's it, that is my complete in-depth PC gameplay review for Snowbreak Containment Zone. If you like this review and would like to see more, please subscribe to my channel and have a nice day.